When doing time frequency analyses, there are major problems with multiple comparisons. And that is because we are doing lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of individual statistical tests on our time frequency pixels. Now, the standard approach in psychology and other related fields for addressing multiple comparisons is actually not appropriate for time frequency analyses. And I'm going to explain why. But first, I want to illustrate what exactly is the scale of the multiple comparisons problem. So let's take a time frequency analysis like this. We have, imagine we have 1000 time points, 40 frequencies, and 16 channels. So this is just for one particular data set. And that gives us 640,000 tests. So 640,000 individual little t-tests or correlation values or you know whatever kind of statistical test we are doing that is a really really large number and you know in some sense this is kind of a, a lowball estimate because i'm not even including different conditions let's say you have three different experimental conditions so then you might want to do two different comparisons so then all of this gets multiplied by two so you can easily have potentially over a million tests that you are doing that's really a lot of multiple comparisons. Now, the standard approach in many fields for statistical um, adjustments of multiple comparisons is coming from this guy. Who is this guy? Well, you might not recognize him by face, but you possibly know his name from a stats course on dealing with multiple comparisons issues. So this guy is Bonfroni. I assume he was Italian. Sounds like an Italian name. Clearly, he was a very serious statistician. You can tell by the look on his face. Anyway, what is the formula for Bonfroni correction? The formula for Bonfroni correction is to take your threshold that you would typically use, so a p-value threshold, let's say of 0.05, it's a standard one, and then you divide that threshold by n, where n is the number of tests that you are implementing, and that gives you the new p-value threshold. So for example, if you have a threshold of 0.05 and you're doing five tests, then your new p-value threshold that you actually use would be 0.05 divided by five, which is 0.01. Okay, so that is the Bonfroni correction. It is a simple and useful method. Now, let us think about some problems with Bonfroni correction. And I want to make clear that I'm putting problems in apology quotes here because these are not really problems with Bonfroni correction per se. The Bonfroni correction method itself is fine, but these are limitations. These are problems with Bonfroni correction as it applies to time frequency analysis and not only time frequency analysis, but also other kinds of data sets where you have strong spatial temporal structure in the data. Okay, so let's think about some of the problems with Bonfroni correction. And of course, I encourage you to pause the video and see if you can come up with some of these yourself. All right, so here we go. I have identified three issues with Bonfroni correction. One is that it is too stringent. Two is that it assumes independence. And three, uh, and, and this is violated, that's the problem. And three is that it's based purely on N and not on the information content in the data. So let's discuss each of these three issues in turn. So number one is that the uh, threshold ends up being too stringent if we try to apply Bonfroni correction appropriately correcting for all of the multiple comparisons. You might get in a simple example that I discussed a moment ago, you might have a Bonfroni threshold of 0.05 divided by 640,000, which is a ludicrously tiny number even real effects, true, absolutely real effects out there in the universe are unlikely to be significant using such a tiny, tiny threshold. The only effect that I would be confident would survive, 0.05 divided by 600,000 would be the difference in brain activity between living people and dead people. That would probably survive, at least for most people. Okay, so Bonfroni is just too stringent. A second issue is that Bonfroni correction assumes independence. That means that to apply Bonfroni correction, you assume that all of your data points are independent, uncorrelated with each other. 
That is obviously not the case for time frequency analyses. Each point, you know, this time frequency point is going to be really, really strongly correlated with the neighboring time frequency point. And that is partly because brain activity is, is autocorrelated over time. And it's also partly because we actually impose smoothing on the data when we do time frequency analysis. So we impose both temporal smoothing and spectral smoothing. So therefore, the independence assumption of Bonfroni correction is totally violated. It is not a valid assumption for these kinds of data sets. Finally, the third point is that Bonfroni correction is based purely on N. It's not based on the information content in the data. And that you see in the formula here. It doesn't actually matter what are the characteristics of the data. All that matters is N. And the problem with that for time frequency analysis is that some of these numbers here are actually pretty arbitrary. So we could do, you know, let's imagine uh, you, you uh, use Bonfroni correction and then you get an effect that isn't quite significant, but you really want that effect to be there. So you need to have a less stringent threshold. So what do you do? You downsample the time points, you do post analysis downsampling, and you get down to a uh, hundred time points instead of a thousand time points. Now the thing is, if you go down, if you downsample your, uh, your, your results to 100 time points, this is going to be 64,000 tests instead of 640,000 tests. And that means that the p-value is going to become more liberal. And you haven't actually changed anything in the results. That All of the features in the resulting time frequency map are the same for 1,000 time points and 100 time points. And we could do the same thing for frequencies. We could reduce or increase the number of frequencies. That doesn't change the information content in the results. It's only changing the sheer number of tests. So that is a fairly awkward feature of Bonfroni correction. And that also means that it's not really appropriate for these kinds of data sets, time frequency data sets. Now, I will repeat something that I've mentioned halfway through the video. This does not mean that you should completely abandon Bonfroni correction, that Bonfroni correction is wrong, and Bonfroni himself should have been a surfer instead of a statistician. Bonfroni correction is great, and there are definitely places where Bonfroni correction is appropriate. In fact, later on in this section, when I start talking about group level analyses, I will talk about a situation where Bonfroni correction makes a lot of sense. However, for doing time frequency or statistics on time frequency analysis results, Bonfroni correction is a poor choice because of these three features. So we have to do some kind of correction for multiple comparisons because we have such a large number of multiple comparisons. And at the same time, Bonfroni correction, which is the standard go-to method, is not appropriate. So what do we do? What is the right way to deal with all of these multiple corrections in a way that is statistically appropriate while still sensitive enough to identify real differences? And that comes up in the next video. So I hope you are looking forward to it. I will see you soon.